Okay, Kia ora koutou. We'll make a start. Uh, <coughs> ko Ian Duggan uh, te ingoa, ko Natau te iwi. Um, don't really need to introduce myself. I think there's only one person in the room that I don't know uh, personally. Um, so we'll get straight into it. We're a little bit behind. Um, so I'm really uh, happy to introduce today Dr. Ian Kusabs, a recent uh, graduate of ours, a recent PhD, uh, who works um, for his own business, Ian Kusabs and Associates. Um, and he is going to be talking today on, uh, on CUDA, uh, freshwater crayfish, about their uh, monitoring, their management, uh, sustainable harvests, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, he was going to be talking with Willie Emery today, but Willie couldn't uh, make it, so it's uh, just Ian that's going to be giving the talk. Um, one request, um, just in Ian's talk, uh, we'll wait till the end uh, for, for questions, just so he doesn't lose his flow, and we'll have a lot of time at the end to ask questions. So I'll hand it over to, uh, to Ian. Uh, kia ora Ian, uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, nā ranga tērā me nā kaumātua, tēnā koutou, uh, ko Ian Kusabs toko ingoa, ko Te Arawa, ko Ngāti Tūwhari Tō, uh, nā iwi. Um, no mai, haere mai uh, ki tēnei whakatūranga, e pāna ki nā kaura e nā roto o Te Arawa. So uh, welcome to my presentation today on <coughs> sustainable management of kaura in Te Arawa Lakes. Unfortunately, Willie uh, Kaumatua Willy Emery couldn't make it. Uh, he's, he's busy with um, lots of other iwi engagements, so he passes on his apologies. Um, he assures me he's not out fishing or collecting coda, so um, we'll let him off. So uh, <coughs> here's the, the little critter we're talking about today. I'm talking about coda, also known as kiwi in parts of New Zealand. Uh, this is the northern species, or Piranophrops planifrons, which is present in the Te Arawa lakes. Uh, historically, it was a very important food source for Te Arawa. Uh, it, was used, it wasn't just only a, a staple food source, but uh, was used for trading with iwi from outlying districts as well. Uh, it's a keystone species, uh, which means it's, a crucial, it's an animal that's crucial to the way uh, an ecosystem functions. So ecologically very important. In the Te Arawa Lakes, Coda uh, recycle a lot of the detritus on the lake bed. They influence uh, the invertebrate species present on the lake bed and also uh, plants that are there as well. Uh, however, there's anecdotal evidence that Coda numbers have declined dramatically since uh, European settlement in the late 1800s. And this has been attributed to eutrophication, water, uh, declining water quality, uh, the introduction of pests and plant species such as trout which prey on coda and uh, aquatic macrophytes, the big oxygen weeds which can uh, affect their distribution and abundance as well. Uh, <coughs> in 2006 the Te Arawa Lake Settlement Act was um, enacted and this empowered Te Arawa to manage the Taonga species which coda are one of those species um, and to uh, bring in their own regulations and their own management plans. So there's been a revival in interest in harvesting um, coda and other traditional species in the Te Arawa Lakes. So, um, but however, um, it's really hard to do fisheries management plans when you don't know anything about the animals that you're meant to be managing. And so the, a lot of this work, as Ian said, as, as part of my PhD study. So the aim of this um, part of the study was to examine catch rates and biological traits of Te Arawa Coda and recommend su uh, sustainable regulations. So the first thing we had to find out was what was the best method to sample Coda. Uh, in, in many parts of uh, lakes around the world, it's, it's quite easy to, to sample Coda in streams, but in lakes it's quite problematic. Uh, we went through a whole lot of different um, methods. We used spotlighting or rumakota. Um, we used scuba diving, uh, transects, etc. Um, underwater cameras and these baited traps, and there's one up here on the screen, a modified uh, G minnow trap. Uh, <coughs> however, they all had uh, uh, problems with those methods. Uh, the spotlighting scuba and underwater camera methods are all visual methods. They're very high, highly variable. They're biased towards uh, large individuals. You can't see the real small ones. Um, they're visibility dependent, and in a lot of the lakes, 
uh, uh, water conditions, there's algae blooms, uh, the rest of it makes it very hard to see things. And they're limited generally to the shallows, particularly spot lighting. Um, but even scuba, when you're diving at depth in the Tiara Lakes, you're a thousand feet above sea level, you do get um, issues. A few people have, had, have got the bends doing scuba in the Rotorua Lakes. And it's generally pretty uh, specialist, it's costly, and uh, with scuba you've got OSH as well. So it's not, not something that you can easily repeat. So we're looking at beta traps as well. Um, pretty much you get, you get low catches. Again, they're biased towards large individuals. They're very biased towards male crayfish. And when they get stolen, you, there goes $50 every time a trap gets stolen, which happens um, more often than not. And the other thing about them, you've got to pick them up before first light. And if you don't, the little ones crawl out of the traps. And when you're getting low catches, you need a lot of traps to get any decent numbers. So uh, I'll just do a bit of Ian's Cora 101 here. Um, we've got a male and a female. Yeah, so you can tell the males have got these lumps on the back legs, and the females haven't. Unless, you, you know, when the females are eggs, obviously they're easier to, to see. So anyways... None of the, we tried all these methods, none of them was really suitable, so we were looking around for another method, and I was talking to an uncle of mine, and he said, oh, why don't you use the traditional toe coder method? And um, he referred me on to uh, Matua Willie, who couldn't make it here today. But uh, Matua Willie was one of the few people, there's only about three whanau in all of the central North Island who are still using this traditional toe coder method. And basically what it is, is a whole lot of um, fern bundles laid on the, on the uh, lake bed and the cora move into them and use them as habitat. So this is the traditional one, uh, which was used in the old days. And the tumu is a big post, it's like a, a big black marmaku trunk that was uh, put into the lake bed and going around and around with a waka, sort of drilled it in. And off here had a, a flax rope with a poitor or float, uh, a little anchor down this end, and it just floated on the, the lake bed, on the lake surface. And there's these pecker pecker were these uh, flax ropes, which the, um, were attached to the whakaweku, the bracken fern bundles. So that was a traditional method. <coughs> and this is a map from um, Don Stafford's Landmarks of Tiarua. And all these little dots here are Kaura fishing grounds. Uh, generally, um, from the 5 metre to 10 metre drop off around there, all these ones around the outside. And there's a lot around Macquarie Island. And they were all uh, signified with these tumu, and they belong to Fano and Hapu groups. Um, so there was sort of, they were owned, those areas were owned. I mean, so, uh, when Gilbert Mayer, Captain Gilbert Mayer, who was the captain of the flying Te Arawa column, um, who uh, did a lot with Te Arawa, protecting Te Arawa after the uh, invasion by Napui, uh, he was gifted one of these um, fishing grounds in, in recognition of his, of his efforts. So <coughs> I think there was over 500 known fishing grounds in Lake Rotorua alone. And there was a, a picture there of a, a, a man going out into the um, Orkiri Arm, actually, of Lake Roriti with a whole lot of fern to replace his fern on his tokota. But unfortunately, uh, you can't have those ones floating around in the lake bed. Um, in the old days, they, <coughs> when they were taking the uh, logs across the lake by boat, they were crashing into the tumu, so um, a lot of them were removed because they were obstruction to to boat passage, and also when trout were introduced, it was um, made fishing a lot harder on the lake. So the modern day tow coder um, works on the same principle, but we're using a sunken uh, anchor line down here, and we're using modern materials, uh, nylon anchor rope we're using, which is um, 10 mil anchor rope. It's relatively cheap, and it's uh, relatively hardy, with uh, a concrete fill to tire as, as our anchor. <coughs> and 
and then obviously we don't use walker anymore but um, modern boats we've even gone up to a bigger boat than this one now <laughs> now there's Willie there and uh, pulling in a fern bundle so uh, <coughs> here's some of the nephews collecting bracken fern bundles out on, at Roridi there uh, ready to go onto the co um, to the tow and they're bound together uh, generally 10 to 12 fronds with cable ties and then you end up with this finished product which pretty much looks like an ice cream cone um, with all the, the, the frondlets up the top and then the stalks cut off at the bottom here and that's ready to go. Uh, those fern bundles will last, uh, if it's a eutrophic lake, about a year. Um, if it's a oligotrophic lake like Tarawera, Rotoma or Taupo, uh, two to three years. And you can just go and pull them up when you want. So I'll just, hopefully this video will go, but um, I'll just show you how, uh, show you um, the tow coder in action. <coughs> so this is the bottom of uh, Lake Tarawera. Those are common bullies. Here's our fern bundle on the lake bed. That's Willie and I up in the uh, retrieving the line. So you just pull yourself along the um, the main line the anchor line. Here's a fern bundle coming up and you can see the Cora's, um, whoops, whoops. Go through that again, it's not much. But the Cora's are all just sitting on the um, fern bundle. And we've been down there and, and looked at these things as they're coming up and the Cora's generally just hang on to that and see one there. Just hang on to that fern bundle until it hits the air, and just like a crab or a crayfish that you catch out in the in the sea, they once they hit the air, they usually drop your bait, you know, and, and jump off. And the same thing with these. So we have this um, specially designed net. You see the cobras hanging hanging on there all through that bundle. We've got a specially designed net. This one was uh, designed by Willie. It's called a core upper. That's just shade cloth, which is pretty, you know, just cheap from Bunnings, ten dollars a square meter or something, on an aluminium frame that we get later. So we pull up the bracken fern bundle, the the fuckerweku, and the core up at the same time. And here it comes. Shake it out, and there's the chorus. It's Mount Tarawera behind you. Then that goes back into the lake, and um, you can go and pick it up next month or the month after, or next month, or there's a special hui or tangi hunger on or something like that. So, um, yeah. Ah. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, if you're using them just to harvest coda, you just pull them up when you want them, put them back in, replace the ferns after two to three years. So um, <coughs> this method, it's got a number of advantages over the Western methods. It gets a wide size range of coda. It's probably the most important thing, from 7 mils OCL up to 50 mils OCL. Um, and another coda 101 here. The way you measure coda is from the back of the eye to the end of the carapace there. And that's called the orbit carapace length, or OCL. So a seven mil coda is probably about the size of your um, thumbnail. So right up to 50 mils like that. Uh, Alan Devsich did a PhD thesis, and Dudley might even remember him, in uh, the 1970s, mid 1970s, and he used beta traps. Smallest uh, coda he got in his traps were about 20 mils OCL, you know, compared to our seven. So he's missed a couple of years of, um, of Cobra age classes, up to about 48. So the, the, the big size isn't too bad, but you just missed the little ones. Uh, there's an unbiased sex ratio. Uh, we're getting about one female to every 
uh, one male to every female, compared to Alan Devstich, who, you know, in the same lake, he was getting about three males to every um, female, because the males are more aggressive and they, they go into the traps uh, to feed. Uh, we get a good catch rate with the tow uh, at Rod Eddy again. Uh, our catch rate was about 27 per, mean catch rate was about 27 per Whakaweku, compared to the uh, beta traps, which are about nine. Uh, you just got to remember the our um, toe is down there for about a month to six weeks before you can actually harvest it, so it gives time for the, the coras to colonise that fern bundle, whereas the beta traps are just left overnight, so 24 hours. So beta traps have their, have their use, um, particularly if you, it's a presence absence thing. Uh, the owls are pretty cheap to set up. Once they're down there, they're pretty hard to find. Um, you know, you've got to find it with GPS on the boat, really. And another good thing with OSH as well is you can retrieve them when conditions are suitable. So you don't have to go with a beta trap, you've got to go and pick it up the next day. Um, otherwise, the bait starts deteriorating and the, and the coras, small coras move out. This one here, just leave it down. Go out on a nice day, enjoy it. And the really cool thing about this method, it's a, a sustainable method. Those fern bundles are actually are working like little hatcheries. The juvenile cobra go in there and they sit in there and they, they grow. The females go in there and they breed, particularly when they got their eggs, when they got their eggs on them. So it not only you're not only taking from the fishery, but you're also giving back to the fishery. So what are the existing regulations? Um, pretty much bugger all, really, um, to be honest. Uh, there's a generic New Zealand-wide uh, limit of 50 cobra per person per day. Uh, you're not allowed to sell cobra collected from the wild. And under the Tiara Lakes Settlement Act, in the, in the case of the Tiara Lakes, uh, the Tiara Lakes Trust are empowered to manage the cobra fishery. Here's a picture of uh, Matua Willy and his moko or Trevor, who, who helps us out. I should say, when we do a lot of this work, um, our monitoring, we always try and employ uh, the rangatahi and try and get them interested in, in science, environmental science. So that's just a typical catch off uh, Willie's tow at um, Emery's Bay. So um, sustainable regulations then. Uh, the, the Tiara Lakes Trust wanted uh, the, the, I was actually on one of the committees and we were wanting to, um, to, to bring in a sustainable management plan, fisheries management plan. So what, what do you need uh, to get sustainable regulations. Well, first you've got to know what's out there, how much of it, and if it's actually uh, enough cobra to be uh, of harvestable size. You've got to know the sex ratio, the breeding times, uh, fecundity is very important in, in um, setting minimum legal lengths, uh, the size at onset of breeding, which I'll talk to a bit about later on, and uh, oh, this photo here is just of engaging with the uh, the kaitiaki around the lake as well. Which you've seen. So what we did um, as part of my PhD work, we looked at coda populations in eight of the Tiarawa lakes. We had two tow coda in each lake, comprised of ten fakaweku, so ten fern bundles um, on two tow coda in each lake. So we looked at uh, these ranged from the very oligotrophic uh, Lake Rotoma. Uh, Tarawera, uh, Mesotrophic, um, Okaraka, Rotokakahi, um, <coughs> uh, Rotiti, uh, Rotehu, uh, Rotorua, right up to the hyper-eutrophic uh, Lake Okaro. And I don't think there's anyone from overseas here, but that's where the Rotorua lakes are. So what did we find? Um, so this graph here is a mean catch per unit effort on the y-axis. Um, so that's the mean catch per whakaweku and uh, along the bottom here we've got the lakes ordered from oligotrophic up to uh, hyper eutrophic and as you can see there's no real relationship between trophic status and, and co abundance uh, you've got lots in Lake Rotoma uh, quite a few in Rotiri and then you've got um, a, a lot of co in Lake Rotorua so, um, but if you look at the biomass, you've, we've only really got um, 
harvestable quantities of coda in these three lakes here, uh, Rotoma, uh, Rotaiti, and Rotorua. These other lakes here at depth, because um, the toko is, is set outside the weed bed, so you're pr pretty much looking at seven metres deeper. This doesn't include the, the shoreline, the shallows. But um, <coughs> so in a lot of these other lakes, there's too few coda to make harvesting worthwhile or there's a lot but they're of small size, like at Orchid Arms a shallow site and um, the cora, mean cora size is only about 16 mils OCL. So the sex ratio, um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, using this method, we went through and these are the age classes here, number of cora on the y-axis, pretty much every age class is about 50-50, male to female. So the uh, Kaura egg bearing season, this is important when you're setting uh, open seasons or closed seasons. And this is the percentage of egg bearing females on the Y axis. And as you can see, not much happening in summer, January, February and March, or even April. And then you get this big, you actually get two peaks through um, May to, to August, and then again from September through to November. Uh, also, from this information, there's cobra always. There's always some cobra that have got, have got eggs. So, uh, a common regulation in most fisheries is you release crayfish with eggs, and um, so that's another. We got out of there. Here's another. Here's a cobra, just a, a female cobra in berry. And this is cobra fecundity, number of eggs on the y-axis again. And as you can see, uh, surprise, surprise, the larger cobra have far more eggs than the smaller ones. And this is important if you're looking at um, if you're looking at slot limits and trying to protect uh, reproductive output. So the size of onset of breeding <coughs> is basically where you ensure that 50% of females uh, are able to breed before they get into before they are legally targeted. So they have to reach a certain size range. And we did this for all the lakes, but this is just the combined graph. And as you can see, 50% here um, from this model, it's about 27 and a half millimetres um, OCL is the length, whereby 50% of females have bred before they enter the catch. Um, we did, did this for all the lakes, um, and it ranged from 22 millimetres in Lake Rotoehu up to 28 mils in Lake Rotorua. So to be conservative and be consistent across the lakes, if someone's going out fishing, we've set it at the highest level of 28 millimetres, or recommended that. So if we look at the slot limit. Um, we also modelled this. If in the future, if cobra harvesting really takes off, uh, you might want to protect those bigger females as well. And um, so having a slot limit was quite common in, in fisheries science. So protecting up to about 28 mils, and then again from 30 mils, 39 mils up to uh, and above, you'd protect roughly about 30% of the reproductive output of um, the cora, female cora population. <coughs> so there's a, another other um, methods that we've um, restrictions that we've recommended and discussed. First is, of all is to limit the deep water harvesting methods to the use of the tow coda only. There's a number of reasons for this. Um, as I mentioned before, the tow coda is a sustainable harvesting method that can enhance the fishery as well. So it's a give, give and a take sort of a, a thing. Uh, the tow coda can be controlled by the Tiara Lakes Trust. Because it's a structure on the lake bed, it has to be registered with the, the Lakes Trust. So they can um, control where they go. They can, as part of the permit regulations, you have to, a fisherman has to give um, his harvest information, his catch information back to the lakes trust. So you get a feedback loop going. So the fisherman actually helping the trust to manage the fishery. Uh, with scuba diving, we've had some problems with scuba in the past. Um, with some of our own people actually going there and, and collecting Cobra and selling them off. Uh, they actually were prosecuted by DOC, but um, on those open lake beds, as you saw in the video, the cobra just sitting there. They're very easy to collect up and 
and um, and to catch and sell. Uh, we also recommend that we don't want commercial commercially made traps to be used because uh, they're difficult to control. You don't get that uh, catch information coming back from the fishermen, and also the potential vectors for uh, plant and animal pests. Uh, for example, in Lake Waikari Moana. Um, it's thought that Lagrosiphon major, one of the, the problem oxygen weeds, got into Waikari Moana on uh, Cobra traps. So uh, just going through the conclusions and recommendations, um, we found harvestable quantities of Cobra in, in three of the eight lakes. Um, there's 15 lakes altogether in Taura Rohi, so uh, we have actually got work planned to look at the other seven lakes and to see if our regulations and policies are suitable for those remaining lakes as well, because they might ha have a different size at onset of breeding or fecundity or, or breeding seasons as well. So they might have to be, might need their own specific regulations. Uh, we want to maintain uh, the existing regulations, so a ban on the commercial sale of coda collected from the lakes. Um, there's also another issue there. A lot of the lakes are very um, heavily influenced by geothermal activity, so a lot of the coda collect uh, bioaccumulate mercury and arsenic. So if you were wanting to sell them, you probably um, yeah, probably wouldn't be allowed anyway. <coughs> uh, you maintain the daily bag limit of 50 cora per person per day with allowance for customary harvest, which would be permitted by the Tiara Lakes Trust. So for tangi hunger, um, uh, even the pork eye or something like that, up to 1,000 cora per day but just on a permit system like they use it the, um, in the marine environment. So yeah, restrict the deep water harvesting methods to the use of the tokora only, I, I just talked about that. Um, ban the taking of egg bearing females. And restrict the tokora um, harvesting season to the 1st of December to the 31st of March. Now this is kind of interesting because uh, Sir Peter Buck wrote a paper in 1921 on the fishing activities of Te Arawa, and they actually had uh, a, almost the same season, they had it from 1st of November through to the end of March as their harvesting season for Kota and, and Lake Rotorua, um, because, the, or obviously because um, they were trying to protect those Kota when they were in breeding time as well, so that matches up really well. And the minimum legal length of 28 mils OCL, uh, we have actually been out with a lot of the, the fishermen and we got a big fish box of coda and said, hey, what's the smallest coda you would take home to eat? And pretty much it was uh, around 30 millimetres OCL. <coughs> and I'd just like to say that all of these conclusions, these recommendations um, have been adopted by the Tiara Lakes Trust and the Committee Whaka Haere. Um, so hopefully we'll have those enacted uh, very shortly when we sort out a few legal issues. So um, that's it. Yeah, so that's all I've got to say. Uh, kia ora. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. Another, as part of my PhD study with um, David, actually co author on a lot of this work as well, <coughs> um, we looked at the co populations in those different lakes and looked at a whole lot of environmental uh, variables. And pretty much anything around Mount Tarawera, the, the eruption in 1886 blew up and put a whole lot of fine mud in a lot of the lakes. And the further you get away from the mountain, the maunga, you get the, the sediment in the lake beds coarser, and that's the main drive of cobra abundance. Same in New Zealand, overseas, wherever, and in these lakes, is the amount of coarse substrate. Lake Rotorua is really shallow, and you get a lot of wind blowing over it, <coughs> and the lake bed substrates from about, from the, yeah, from the shoreline down to about 15 metres are really coarse, and they just love it. They love coarse substrate. Whereas you go to Tarawera and you go out at depth to 30 metres, just 
it's like quicksand, you know, it's just like mud. They don't like it. This is also noticed um, during the fact that two crooks of other sites were around the arm, so it yep. actually reflects a wider, you know, wider um, population and harvest of the sort of nature of the whole body. Good question. Uh, what we did, um, subsequent work, we, we ran those lines out to um, half a kilometre off the island, so right out into the deep, deep. And um, the cobra are right out, right on on the edge of those of that half a kilometre out. So the substrate, it basically, if the substrate's good, they'll be there. But mainly around that drop-off area, like Lake Wotaru is so shallow, you you know, as you know, you've got to walk it a long way to get to five metres. But along that drop-off, yeah. We've got more work planned for Lake Wotaru as well with um, the various hapu. Kevin? Uh, they were traded, um, they dried and preserved, yeah, and, but they were translocated a, around a lot of the, wherever um, Māori went, really. Same with Kaki, they moved them around a lot, <coughs> from what I've read. Oh, no, for, uh, yeah, definitely. Particularly if they were leaving them for um, that big closed season and leaving the females undisturbed to breed and the juveniles to rear and then coming back again in November and starting to harvest them after the end of the breeding season. Yeah, it was, it's one of the few fishing methods that is actually um, enhances a fishery. You could, uh, but you'd need a, a lot of them, I'd say, in there. Uh, there's a lot of coda around the shallow, in the shoreline around Tarawera, uh, because that's where the waves go, that's windswept, and the, the substrates are coarse. But when you get out there deep, and we, we scuba dive down all these tow lines to check that our results were, you know, married up with that, with what was actually happening on the lake bed there. And it's, you dive down um, your tow coda line, and you'd just see nothing, it's just mud, 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 and then you'd see a log or a big rock or something, and then there's coras just all over that habitat. So you could, yeah, if you had enough of them. Overseas, it, they, to enhance uh, crayfish numbers, they just go and dump a whole lot of rocks in the, in the lake or some habitat, logs or whatever. It's just give them habitat. And particularly important if you've got introduced uh, fish predators in there, like perch or even tuna. Tuna are really good predators of Kaura. Yeah, I was going to ask a, a true for map question in relation to tuna or you and what you would have been in the lake. I mean, I've got down to understand the food laws, but the lake itself doesn't have tuna in it, like the food laws. Yeah, it's a good point. That's why the, there's a lot, this was such a strong Kaura uh, fishery in these lakes, yes. is because of the the absence of those of tuna. Trout do eat a lot of uh, coda as well, but they're not a bottom feeder. They're really chasing around fish in the middle of the water column. Most of the time, they do go down sometimes. So it's a way of food source, but not the, not the tuna. What's that, sorry? In, in lakes, what's the Yeah. So it, it sustains coda, but not tuna. Yeah, the tuna can't get there from the um, sea. As part of their life cycle, they have to go to the so sea to breed. into the lake for like some Tuna. There's a few in them. So, yeah. so that seems to have odds, you know, that the, the creeps leading into the lake is tuna and not the lake itself. Yeah. A lot of those ones in the streams are scapees that they, people have let go, but they're not naturally, they can't get up there. So there's not the huge numbers of tuna you get down the Waikato River. A uh, <coughs> good example, we've been doing some work with Niwa uh, over the past couple of years in the Waikato River hydro lakes, mm -hmm. which used to be full of coda, and the commercial eel fishermen have been putting in. Uh, two million, rough, roughly two million elvers a year into the seven of the hydro lakes, and now you're pretty much hard pressed to find a cobra in the Waikato hydro lakes. But you go up into the tributaries where there's lots of rocks and cobbles and stuff, and the two will coexist. Yep. 
Solid. Uh, at, anyone can apply, yeah. Just sit, but you have to, because it's on the lake bed, something on the lake bed, anything on the lake bed now you need a permit from the Tiara Lakes Trust. But yeah, anyone can apply for it. I had a bunch of questions as well. I thought I'd let everyone else have a go first. Oh, can go Sorry. for it, Ian. Well, yeah. One last question, I'll take my other ones for later. Yeah. Um, first of all, crayfish, are they, have they been Yeah, they were very um, important in the Scandinavian countries and northern European countries and also through to Turkey. Most people, most of those um, indigenous people use baited minnow trap sort of structures over there. But I have done some research in, into parts of Asia. They did use um, not bracken fern but something very similar like brush to catch crabs and shrimps. But the, the, you know, it's a, sort of a method that sort of died out overseas is, Mouldy have kept it going around um, the central North Island lakes anyway. Yeah. Well, I think everyone agrees that was a very interesting and exciting talk. There was certainly lots of interest.